This week on the Backtable Podcast. Clearly, the strategy that I followed is get involved. And so that is always my advice to people. Get involved, whether it's your sectional leadership, whether it's national leadership, whether it's on one of the committees that I've just discussed or going to the summit. Make sure your voice is heard because the only way that you can change the organization is from within. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Rishika Talwar, who's a fellow at Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the show, Rishika. How's it going today? It's going so well, Aditya. Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled. You know, as we kind of thought about and planned this discussion around advocacy, I was kind of reflecting and I don't think I've been a good advocate, you know, kind of thinking about my journey as an American. I think I joined the AMSA, the American Medical Student Association, and I never really did very much with it. Then I very tangentially joined the AMA and now I just get like emails about like insurance and those go directly into the recycling bin. And to be quite frank, even my kind of urology participation has been a little lackluster. But I am optimistic. I'm going to be empowered when we're all said and done to like get in there and understand the things that I'm enthusiastic and passionate about and do something about it. But why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in advocacy? Tell us a little bit about your story. Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to make a point to say that it is never too late, Aditya. So don't be afraid to jump right in there after this chat. My journey in advocacy started pretty early. I actually was in high school and I was trying to figure my life out, trying to decide what path I saw myself going into educationally. And I really thought I was going to be a politician, believe it or not. Issues were always my thing. I love taking up causes. You know, you might remember that tsunami that happened in like the early 2000s. I was like, excited. I did a middle school fundraiser for that. And I was like, I'm going to change the world, you know. So I went to Princeton University for a summer program as a high schooler, and I met New Jersey's finest politicians. Now, as you can imagine, I was quite underwhelmed and honestly, totally like turned off. I thought to myself, I could never see myself being a politician. These people creep me out. I don't really get the sense that they're in it for the right noble altruistic reasons. So what's next? And I turned to medicine. I come from a family of doctors. It made sense. I really liked science. However, you know, as I started undergrad specifically, I really started to miss that policy engagement. So I ended up pursuing biology and legal studies. And my thesis was the development of the IRB in response to the awful things that happened in Tuskegee. And I realized that, you know, I would say medicine and politics are really intimately intertwined. Fast forward to med school, again, looking for that kind of involvement. And I turned to the AMA, as it sounds like you did as well. And I made my way through the national ranks of leadership in the AMA as a medical student, found urology as a specialty, and then again, just tried to continue that same involvement as a urology resident. I have been really involved with both the AUA and the AMA from an advocacy perspective. Well, I I think it's a great story. And sometimes, you know, sticking to these things that we're passionate about, whether that's, you know, global volunteerism or advocacy becomes challenging as we go through medical school and residency and, you know, our life changes and priority changes. And I applaud you for being able to kind of stick with it. But maybe let's just start out with some, you know, some basic definitions. What does advocacy mean to you? It's a great question. And I can tell you right now that this answer will have very different spins to different people. So for me, I look at advocacy very broadly. It really is picking a topic, which could be anything from patient care, advancing the profession, to even other things not related to medicine for physicians. But it's picking a topic and trying to make a broad impact. The way that I go about doing this is through organized medicine. In 2022, there were only 17 physicians in Congress. And for that reason, when healthcare issues come to light, 
they turn to organized medicine for an opinion because they can't be experts in everything. And so that brings me to why I think organized medicine is so important. It allows us all to have a unified voice. A lot of people say, I'm a urologist. The AMA doesn't necessarily speak for me. I don't agree with their top with their stances on certain topics, but their strength in numbers and they're the largest organization of physicians in the United States. So I think that's why organized medicine is my path to advocacy. You know, I feel like advocacy, policy, these are such like broad terms that sometimes making it a little bit digestible can be challenging. And like you said, we can advocate for our patients, you know, what, like filling out a peer to peer denial, you're advocating for your patient, I suppose. And absolutely. Then there's kind of the departmental hospital level, maybe the local level, the national level, the state level. Do you think about it kind of in those spheres or how do you think about it? I think about it exactly how you've mentioned it. Advocacy happens on different layers. I'm kind of talking broadly about advocacy at a national level. Those are things like the AUA summit coming up, those Hill visits that we do. But advocacy happens on a very micro level as well. It can occur at a departmental level when you notice that there's something that can be improved. For example, a quality improvement initiative, that's advocacy. Things like working on OR start times or turnover times, that's advocacy. State level issues are really important for urology. Things like coverage of PSA blood tests at the state level. There's legislation in New York mandating no cost sharing for PSA. That's advocacy. And it really can apply to so many different things. Yeah. And honestly, sometimes I feel like, especially in academic medicine, we get so caught up in the non practical implement, you know, things that are kind of happening, whether that's reimbursement or coverage of certain tests and procedures. And this is actually something where I think we can really learn from our colleagues in private practice. For instance, LUGPA, the large urology group practice, I feel like they do like a really good job of identifying things that affect our patients, affect our own kind of well-being in some form or fashion. But, you know, I, I think broadly, whether this is like useful at all, advocacy is, you know, basically advocating for something within our social system, whether that's a cause, whether that's for our patients, whether that's for ourselves, and not just doing it by like, you know, complaining to the person next to me that my turnover has been an hour and a half, but maybe organizing, you know, 50 surges and saying that this unacceptably high turnover is affecting our quality of life and our productivity. And here's like a plan and, you know, do something about it, which nearly certainly carries a bit more weight. Well, you know, maybe we could take a topic, something that I think we're all at least in some form or fashion familiar with. I'll pick PSA screening, which has had a pretty topsy-turvy rocky road over the last decade or so. And talk about how the AUA is involved. You know, sometimes it seems like such a foreign process with these leaders that are inaccessible talking to politicians that are inaccessible, talking to the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is some abstract foreign object. And maybe you can just kind of like walk us through how that process takes place and then how as a common urologist, our voice can be heard. Sure. Absolutely. Before I jump right into that, I want to make one comment on something you said a little while ago, which was advocacy being a tool to go back and fight the things you're frustrated about. My personal journey with advocacy has actually helped me fight off burnout. It lets me take ownership in things I find frustrating. And as surgeons, you know, we often like to see immediate impact of the things we do, whether it's treating a kidney stone, putting a stent up, taking out a tumor. And for me, advocacy gives me that feeling of ownership over the system and it helps me make a difference. Now, to go right into PSA screening, as you mentioned, PSA screening definitely has been pretty topsy turvy <laughs> over the past couple of years. I'll rewind back to around 2008. The U.S. PSTF, or the United States Preventative Services Task Force, started making recommendations on certain screening tools. And when the Affordable Care Act was passed, U.S. PSTF recommendations were actually tied to reimbursements. So things that were graded a grade A or a grade B were fully covered, for example. So that's why the U.S. PSTF 
ended up getting a lot of power. In 2012, the USPSTF made a grade D recommendation for prostate cancer screening. So that means they were actually recommending against prostate cancer screening. The urologists immediately recognized that this was a flawed recommendation. They were using studies that were biased, for lack of a better term, and didn't necessarily fully demonstrate the full degree of benefit to PSA screening because of things like cross-contamination of groups, et cetera. And immediately, organized urology jumped in and said, wait a second, we have no representation on the USPSTF. There's no specialty physicians who were consulted. Urology was never engaged as a stakeholder in this process. And fast forward now to 2023, we're actually seeing a really concerning trend in metastatic disease at presentation for prostate cancer. So essentially, we were catching prostate cancers a lot earlier during the window for cure, whereas now patients are coming in with more advanced disease, which is a big concern. So in the interim, the AUA, the AACU, and groups like LUGPA, as you referenced, really jumped in and advocated for legislation that held the USPSTF a little more accountable for these things and encourage them to engage specialty physicians or specialty stakeholders. We met directly with USPSTF. We met directly with government organizations. And we actually discussed these issues with our legislative representatives at multiple time points during agency meetings, during every single AUA summit or what was then referred to as the JAC, the Joint Advocacy Conference. It was still the same fly-in of urologists meeting with their representatives discussing these issues. Okay, say this grade D recommendation came out today. What would that trigger? Would that be that the president of the AUA emails out to some action committee and they're like, holy smokes, this just happened, this affects us? Or whether that's, you know, CISTOs are going to be reimbursed $500 less or you name it, right? That anything that that's kind of a main thing. So... Like kind of walk us like ultra organically through where this starts. Sure. If you don't mind. Of course. I will use, how about I use an example, like what just happened with the Medicare payment cuts. We caught wind that there was going to be an across the board Medicare payment cut. And the AUA found out about this. Right away, they mobilized. The first thing they did was send a blast email out to all AUA members presenting them with the opportunity to comment. So if you can recall, we got a blast saying, click here, one click, reach out to your congressional representative, explain to them that this is going to significantly impact the quality of care that's delivered to all patients. We mobilized, we sat in on calls with these organizations like CMS, like congressional representatives that we have good relationships with, urologists in Congress, such as the ones from Florida and North Carolina. And we told them that this is completely unacceptable because of the work that was done mobilizing right away. And all of those urologists who clicked that link and sent their feedback to their representatives, the most recent omnibus bill actually slashed the amount of payment by one fourth. So it was only about a two percent cut. That occurred, which is not perfect. I concede it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than an eight and a half percent cut to all payments across the board. Yeah. So without making it sound like overly simplistic, the first thing I think we can do is just make sure that we're members of organizations such as the AUA and, you know, other ones that could affect us and B, just making sure like something as simple as your your contact email and so forth being up to date so that we can very passively be involved. You get an email and here you check a box and it says, I care about this issue or I sign a petition. Is that like a a bare minimum way to engage in advocacy in your opinion? I totally agree. That is the bare minimum way to have your voice heard. Clicking on that email or better yet, forwarding that email to your colleagues because you know half of your colleagues are going to go ahead and delete that and not even read it. There's a lot of email fatigue, just like there's a lot of Zoom fatigue and fatigue of all things virtual. It makes a big difference for you to say, hey, friends, this is an important issue. We need to have our voice heard. Please click this link. Perfect. So, you know, without really getting the nitty gritty, at least in maybe a 
reactionary response type of way. The AUA assesses engagement interest for the community for things that are obviously going to affect us. Is there like a policy committee that says, hey, we've got to, you know, nimbly and rapidly organize, get on a call, come up with a position statement, gather the, you know, appropriate data? I can just imagine for the AUA PSA task force, it was like, let's look at these studies and look at contamination and the decrease in right, rates of metastatic cancer. And, you know, we've got this like slide deck. So when we sit down with Congressman Joe Schmo and President of the USPSTF, we can say, here's our unified consensus position. And we're putting it out there in white papers and blue papers. And, you know, is that kind of how this works? That is, but that's the first step of how this works, is gathering the data like, how, like you just talked about. The next step is actually spinning it into stories. Because let's be honest, congressional representatives, their offices, they're a bunch of 25-year-olds who don't have the medicine background that we have who don't have the biostats background that we have. So they rely on us to distill all of this information down in a digestible way. And we always tell people that, you know, what's more meaningful than quoting the study? It's giving your patient story. And that's where I think LUGPA really has it right. When they go to the Hill, they bring these gut-wrenching stories of how patients miss the window for cure or how prior authorizations led to a potential catastrophic complication. That is what resonates more with our congressional representatives. I'll just briefly comment, since you brought up the structure of the AUA's policy workings, there are several committees. The Public Policy Council is the broad committee. And then under that, there's things like the Legislative Affairs Committee, a committee for coding and reimbursement, and the list goes on and on and on. So it's a big topic. And we have incredible staff at the AUA that work day in and day out to advocate for all of these issues, because there's a lot that falls under the umbrella of health policy. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I, again, embarrassingly don't even understand like this kind of policy arm of the AUA. I get the emails and I'm excited. Like one of our residents went to the summit and it was like wonderful to see them. But so there's, there's kind of the maybe keeping a finger on the pulse for like things that are coming through that affect us. And nearly certainly it's the job of the people that are spearheading these committees to say, hey, gang, this came through or it's going to come through. We should try to be a little bit proactive here. And who wants to spearhead creating, crafting some patient stories, creating our position statement. And then, and then you want to share it with, with relevant people, local, state, national legislators. And is that conversation facilitated through the AUA? It sure is. The AUA has a staff person who's dedicated just to state advocacy related issues. And that person actually connects urologists with their appropriate congressional representatives, because we really do rely on the voice of the clinician. That's what's missing from a lot of these health policy initiatives that you see. So our AUA staff is able to, to make those connections. And I'll just mention, it's not just that the AUA gets alerted to a relevant issue. Again, in those emails that we so often delete, there is a legislative priority survey that goes out to AUA members. And you get to vote and prioritize on what is most important to you. In addition, organizations such as SWU, such as the SUO, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, SUFU, et cetera, et cetera, they all get to rank what policy issues are most important to them as well. And the AUA takes all of this data into account when they're deciding what the AUA's legislative priorities are going to be. Okay, so... It's, you know, just like as cheeky and cliche as it is, like our vote matters, you know, what are going to be the topics that our leadership in our community are going to kind of focus on? And it kind of seems like an excuse, but I don't even know where to access the contact information for our local state legislators and even what the policies that I should be advocating for on behalf of my patients and probably, frankly, on behalf of myself. So maybe just a little bit about resources, Richka. Can you tell us about, you know, what's your like go-to urology advocacy like landing spot? We actually get emails from the AUA policy folks with updates. That's a great place to start. 
And for people who are more interested in local issues that could be affecting them, every few months, your AUA section sends out a policy update as well that's been crafted and curated by the AUA policy office. Your section is a great place to start because, as you said, it can be kind of overwhelming. The thought of going to D.C. to go attend an annual meeting is not reasonable for everyone. Not everyone can leave their clinic office. So I think engaging in your section can be really helpful because they're able to connect you with resources to make change at either the hospital level, the local level or the state level, which can be very impactful. You know, as as we're kind of talking here, you know, my main area of academic interest is testis cancer. I have a lab. I write grants. I get money. Some part of that is used to support my time that's not clinical time. And hearing you talk, I'm like, man, I would find it very challenging to say, I mean, one of the things that kind of always tough for me when I have uninsured or underinsured testis cancer patients that can't pay for sperm banking. You know, it's usually upfront, 400 bucks to cryo preserve and then about 100 bucks a year afterwards. And for resource limited people, that's a chunk of change. And I think to myself, like, man, wouldn't it be amazing if that was just like covered as a part of your like cancer care? No, not an excuse. Could I like put this together and like the detriment and the downstream cost of like having to get like IVF or whatever the psychological impacts of like not having biological children, or whatever. But let's just like walk through something along those lines and how a person would get the time. You know, is this something that you talk to your chairperson about and say, hey, my main shtick isn't necessarily research or education. Like, I don't want to be like an assistant program director. I'm an advocacy person. I'm a policy person. How do you convince somebody that is a good value use of your time? And how does that actually get paid for? Yeah, great question. I'm very lucky that I am doing my fellowship and actually staying on as faculty at Vanderbilt in a place that understands the value of this work. But I have this conversation with residents all the time because there's trainees who reach out and say, I am very interested in advocacy and health policy. How do I get the support from my program leadership to prove that although I may not be presenting an article, a first author abstract at a meeting, this work is still impactful. And the first step is to use those resources because, again, there's strength in numbers reach out to understand the landscape of these issues. And then when you go to your program leadership, what you want to do is give tangible ways that you can improve the department or the division that you're working in. So again, if you are interested in sperm banking for cancer care, we stand on the shoulders of giants who actually work to get federal funding from the VA to cover fertility related care after veterans who have gotten Eurotrauma related injuries, relaying those patient stories, often engaging your own patients in explaining why growing a family is important to them. These young men who may lose the ability to do so because they're undergoing cancer treatment. Bring all that information to your section or even better to your state government, which is often a great place to start and make the case for why this is important. The AUA, and I should also mention organizations like the AACU, they will help you get in contact with congressional representatives who will often take up this issue. I just talked about Eurotrauma as a way to start. Another amazing story is, like I referenced earlier, New York getting full coverage for PSA screening. Even here in Tennessee, back when a lot of this USPSTF issue was going on, some of the folks where I am now at Vanderbilt reached out to Marsha Blackburn's office, and she was actually the co-sponsor on the uh, USPSTF Transparency Act that was introduced in the Senate. So, you know, the first step, I would say, is just making a case for your why. And in the era of COVID, pandemic-related health policy changes, people will listen. I'd like to actually take a moment to also recognize that telemedicine, which has absolutely revolutionized the way that we care for patients in the pandemic, is being led nationally by a urologist. Chad Elimoodle at University of Michigan is one of the national leaders who engages with policymakers at both the state and the national level. He's flown out and testified in front of Congress. He has been quoted on various news networks presenting the work that he's done. So 
I think there's a lot of examples as to how people have been successful in this manner. Those are phenomenal stories. And, you know, Chad talked about optimizing telehealth on the podcast a few years ago. And it's just amazing to see, you know, his level of understanding, kind of the implications for access, cost, all of that, and to understand it and know it well. But really what it boils down to is that I think our community is chock full of bright people. And you find, just like anything, you know, whether it's research or teaching, find some mentors that can kind of shepherd you through the process, that have some expertise, that can put you in touch with your sectional leadership or the AUA leadership. Because my sense is that this is an area where the AUA is hungry for additional participation, that this isn't some closed room, smoke, cigars, where everybody wants to just hold a bunch of power. It's like, hey, let's get out there and advocate for ourselves and for our patients and, you know, with interest at the student level, at the resident level, and so on, just track down anybody, you know, talk to somebody within your department that's got an inkling of interest. And, you know, if you're passionate about it and it makes sense, you could maybe take it somewhere. Absolutely. The AUA is very hungry for increased engagement and participation for policy-related issues, especially from our younger generation. There was a recent AUA news publication that presented data from one of the surveys that the AUA gave out after the Dobbs decision. It was assessing whether or not our urologic community felt that the AUA should be advocating for areas that were not necessarily in the purview of urology, but maybe related to healthcare in general. And if you look at the results of that survey, you see some interesting data. The majority of younger urologists and trainees, approximately 70 percent of them, felt that the AUA should be advocating for these issues. But then if you look at the older generation of urologists, the majority of them close to 70 percent in the 60 range, felt the AUA should not be speaking out on issues that aren't directly related to urology. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that there's a shift happening. And there's been a general theme that we've touched on. The AUA historically has been pretty reactive when it comes to these issues. We've talked about PSA screening, for example. Another thing that the AUA has been very vocal on is legislation as it relates to pediatric urologic surgery. Again, an example in which the AUA has been very reactive. But I think my generation and the generation of younger urologists coming in has an opportunity to change the way we view policy-related issues and become a lot more proactive. So what does that mean? Something that I've been working on academically, because I do have an interest in research, is modeling how different legislative issues or different changes to reimbursement or drug pricing can affect the way we provide care. To that end, what we're able to do is bring, again, this data and these stories to our policymakers and say, this is what you should be using when you're drafting what tomorrow's healthcare delivery system is going to look like. Not so much, hey, we have this idea, how is it going to affect you? But instead, have the physician take a little more ownership and disseminate the amazing research that's being done across the country to the people who have the ability to kind of reframe the healthcare system at a policy level. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there are certain things that I think are I use this statement intentionally, kind of squarely within our lane, PSA screening, care of people that have received Euro trauma as a part of their military commitments. You know, Steve Hudak was a fellow when uh, I was a resident, and then I was fortunate enough to overlap with him as a partner for a few years. Amazing. The whole story of a research idea to writing the the experience of these vets and the impact on their life to, you know, changing policy where there's money and attention and resources spent is, is amazing. An entire Eurotrauma task force. I mean, that's a huge win to have the government dedicate millions and millions and millions of dollars to caring for these veterans, researching the relevant issues and then providing them coverage. Dr. Hudak, Dr. Edney, all the work that they've done, it's amazing. And then, of course, there's, I think, topics that are affect all of us as human beings. You know, recently we hosted a conference here at UC San Diego entitled Urology for Social Responsibility. And the topics of interest were 
healthcare disparities, structural racism, climate change, DEI, global volunteerism. And the opinions towards some of these topics, I would say, are less straightforward. You know, women's health and the Dobbs decision, you know, that's not one that's uniformly going to carry probably the same reaction from anybody. If I'm to speak candidly, I think that position statement from the AUA came out. It was pretty lukewarm and it generated quite a bit of discussion, to put it euphemistically. And, you know, actually, I did send an email out to the AUA leadership and I was just saying, hey, I think that, you know, we could, as people that are involved in healthcare, reproductive healthcare, that we could take a stronger stand. And I was actually pleased. So, actually, backing up, one of my co chiefs, forwarded me the email and was like, hey, here's the people that you could contact. And I did. And I got a response back that was like, you know, we've received a lot of feedback and we're working on coming up with something. And then sure enough, there was a uh, a survey disseminated and you kind of shared those results. So walk us through a little bit about, you know, some of these things that are maybe a little bit more controversial. How does that go through the AUA? The AUA is our organization. So I'd say if we take issue with the way that things have been handled or position statements that have been put out or the historic stance, clearly the strategy that I followed is get involved. And so that is always my advice to people. Get involved, whether it's your sectional leadership, whether it's national leadership, whether it's on one of the committees that I've just discussed or going to the summit. Make sure your voice is heard, because the only way that you can change the organization is from within. I think the results of that survey are very telling. To the AUA's credit, they put out those survey results very candidly and with a lot of transparency for us to see. And as I mentioned, when you have the majority of urologists who make up urologic leadership purely Let's take some of the other layers out of it. You know, we can talk about opportunity for women, disparities in, for other racial ethnic groups in urology. But I'm going to take all of that out of it. And I'm just going to say, look at the amount of people who have enough experience to be in urologic leadership. They generally make up that majority that doesn't necessarily believe the AUA should take a stance on issues that are not directly related to urology. What does that mean for me? That means that more people of my generation need to stand up, apply for these leadership positions, volunteer their time on these committees, because guess what? I should make very clear, rather, I was not privy to exactly how that statement was crafted, but I know that it had to have some sort of support, whether that's through a vote. Generally, it's done through a vote. But look at who's making up the committee that's voting on that issue. If we want to change the kind of topics that we advocate for that requires people of my generation to get involved and have a seat at the table. Yeah, I think it's massive. And I feel like even the course of, of my career that, you know, many of these panels at the SUO, panels at the AUA, there's really been a sincere effort to increase representation age, gender, ethnicity, I mean, however you want to kind of slice and dice it. So it's not the same people that, that have been doing these things for years and years. And the message as I hear it loud and clear is, hey, come on in, share your voice. And it, it's a lot easier to advocate on behalf of something that's important to you. I don't know, residency, work hours or maternity, paternity leaves. If you've got somebody else there, you know, if you're the only woman with 30 other people and you don't feel comfortable bringing up having maternity leave that's six weeks or eight weeks or something better than it used to be, that's different than there's 15 women that say, hey, this would have been massive for my quality of life to have extended you know, maternity leave. Same for women's health access, that if you hear from 20 people that you know, I need to be able to kind of control my health and my body during residency because here's the data, here's the literature, that's way more empowering than to be in there. And, you know, I don't need to give like 55 examples of this, but I think the kind of point comes across, hopefully. Absolutely. I mean, I'll say when I got involved with the AUA delegation to the AMA, I was the first female, still am, 
for the record, the only female on that delegation. So I would gladly welcome more women who are interested in getting involved with the AUA's efforts within the American Medical Association, because it is challenging sometimes to be the only one to voice a certain opinion. And so that's my personal plea to the urologic community is, you know, I know that we're out there. Let's stand up and have our voice heard. Now, I'll have to acknowledge that, you know, it's often unfair to place that burden only on women or minority urologists or minority trainees. We do definitely rely on our allies to speak up as well. And so it's a call to action for all of us, truly. Yeah, absolutely. We had a wonderful talk on allyship today from Suzette Sutherland as a part of our visiting professorship. And, you know, you kind of hit the nail on the head that, you know, it's really unfair to ask a single person as a representative of an entire people or ideology or whatever to to be the only voice there. And I think for for all of us, it is an opportunity to really kind of participate in and really advocacy in many ways is allyship. You know, we're advocating on behalf of somebody that doesn't have the same type of voice at the table as us. Absolutely. So you've alluded to it several times and it's upcoming. The AUA Summit. Tell us about that. What kind of happens? Can we still register? Is it in person? Is it online? Is it too late? Just walk us through that a little bit, Richka. Sure. The AUA Summit is the annual advocacy event. It's what we call a fly-in, where urologists from all over the country fly into Washington, D.C. The first day and a half consists of sessions where we cover the AUA's legislative priorities for this year. We also cover issues that are health policy adjacent and important to urologists, things like telemedicine, changes in coding and reimbursement, how to improve the retention diversity of our urologic workforce, things like research funding for both benign and malignant urologic issues. We have sessions on those. Then we discuss basically how we're going to strategize at our Hill visits. All of the urologists who fly in from their respective areas are scheduled by the AUA. It takes no effort on your part, but you're scheduled to meet with your congressional offices. Now, for some people who get really lucky, they get to meet with their congressional representative themselves. But usually you're meeting with staffers who work in those offices. But fear not, those are actually the people making the decisions on healthcare related issues. So, you know, it's not like oh, I'm not meeting with my representative. I'm not going to have an impactful visit. I actually argue that your visit is more impactful if you're meeting with the lead staffer for healthcare. And that's when urologists get to share their patient stories. Give them an example of how prior authorization is a huge barrier to providing high quality care. Or for residents, talk about the burden of student loans and why your congressional representative should support a new piece of legislation that the AUA is really championing, which is the Rural Workforce Shortage Act, aiming to provide debt relief for physicians who work in those underserved areas. And at those visits, you're able to establish relationships with these offices because, again, these people need your help. When there's a healthcare related issue locally, you leave your business card, they are actually likely to engage you if you're willing to be continually involved. When something comes up, they often need the voice of the physician, whether it's your feedback, whether it's having you engage through the health system, et cetera. There's a lot of opportunities there. And I think it's an amazing way to really immerse yourself in this world of health policy that we've been discussing that most urologists are not even aware of. And I shared this a little bit myself earlier. It's a big way to fight burnout. I think it's really easy to feel like you're just a cog in the wheel of this big healthcare system. And, you know, you get really frustrated and you're like, okay, I only have time for my patients. I have enough on my plate with clinic and OR and whatnot. But these kinds of things really remind me of the bigger picture. The fact that we're providing care to an entire population of people with urologic needs and our voice is important. Two more points I'll say, actually. It is not too late to register. AUASummit.org. Registration is free, completely free. And like I said, all you have to do is show up. The AUA takes care of 
getting your meeting scheduled. It, it's no effort to schedule those meetings with your congressional representatives. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, as you're kind of describing this, like I, I'll never forget like the first conference I went to and I was so excited. There's all this like amazing research and you get to like present and it's just like you come home and you've got like 6,000 new ideas and you want to change the world. And what I'm kind of getting is like, this is kind of like the policy equivalent. And then, you know, nearly certainly I'm guessing at the AUA and sectional meetings, there's always like a little policy subcommittee meeting and slowly you start kind of meeting the people that are the doers of the shakers and kind of get there. And it sounds like an awesome way to just like jump in hook, line and sinker. So it's, it's about, I guess what, 40 days out till the start let's just say a, a trainee wasn't able to arrange the logistics of a fly-in. Any virtual options? Yeah, reach out to the AUA staff because they often have virtual fly-ins that they conduct when important urologic-related health policy issues are on the docket. In addition to that, for the trainee specifically, there's something called the AUA Policy and Advocacy Resident Work Group. That is a bunch of like-minded trainees, both residents and fellows, who are really passionate about getting involved with advocacy in, you know, the ways that we've talked about, but in broader ways, too, whether it's working within their residency program to educate other trainees on how to be engaged or whether it's working to organize at a state level when urologic health policy related issues are coming up. We have regular meetings and we conduct what, what are called fireside chats every couple months that you'll see on Twitter. So the policy and advocacy work group has been a great way to form this community. In addition to that, the AUA has several programs. I'm currently the American Urological Association's whole crew fellow. So what that means is I spend a year engaged in these sort of issues that we've talked about. But I also get a couple of cool experiences. In the summer, I'm going to spend a month on the Hill working at a congressional office, TBD, regarding whose office. <laughs> it's a work in progress, but that'll be something I get to do, which I'm really excited about. And I do a Brandeis leadership course as well that's virtual. In addition to the whole group, there's another fellowship that is geared more towards mid-career urologists that you can look into. And for people who are a little more on the quality side, the AUA also has a science and quality scholar. So there's a couple of ways to get involved at various levels. Yeah, I love that. You know, there's two things from today's talk that kind of particularly resonated with me. One is where you said, it's not too late. I love that kind of as a life philosophy in general for anything new, passion projects, learning expertise, growth mindset, it's never too late. And, you know, certainly as it pertains to policy. And the second thing that I really liked is when you said the AUA is our organization. This is not like a us versus them. I've always kind of been like a anti-establishmentarian <laughs> type of dude that you could ask my parents about that. But, um, you know, this really, it's us. It's a reflection of us. It's people that want to advocate for the things that are important to us. And it's incumbent on us to let the leadership know what that is, because if that voice is never heard, it's it's so easy to just bypass it with the other important things that are going on. I totally agree. I totally agree with everything you've said, both as urologist holding the AUA accountable, but as well as a broader community of physicians holding other organizations like the AMA and our congressional representatives accountable. How are they advocating for our best interest? But moreover, how are they expected to know what's best for our patients and profession if we don't have our voices heard? Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense, right? Like where as we start to like specialize or differentiate, you know, we're doctors, then we're urologists, then we're academic urologists or clinical urologists, large practice, small practice, private practice, hospital employed. It goes on and on. And, you know, it's important that we're advocated for and advocating for ourselves within all of those things. You know, it's not really reasonable to expect that there's a bunch of people sitting around thinking these are the things that affect me the most and trying to advocate on my behalf if it's not me. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, there's not like a boatload of people thinking about how I can work less and get paid more. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, that, that's kind of on me, I suppose, all joking aside. Well, hey, Rich, you know, I've learned a lot about the process. I think it's demystified much of what goes on behind the scenes, 
the kind of take home messages for me are get involved. People want you to get involved and it's too easy if there's things that you're passionate about and that it's not this major three day a week time commitment that you can kind of like fit it in like pretty reasonably well. That's totally accurate. The reason I love the summit is because it's my way to make a big impact and it's three days out of the year. For those who are inclined to make it a little more of a regular part of their schedule, we talked about a bunch of committees that you can get involved with. And then at the bare minimum, once every few months when that email goes out and our organization asks for your input, just click the link, sign your name and have your voice heard. I love it. Well, I typically at the end of the episode, ask the guest if there's any kind of you know, parting thoughts that they like to lead for the listenership. And I'll open with that, but I think you might've just captured it. Yeah, well, I'll actually go back to what I said in the beginning is please get involved. It's never too late. The AUA really needs your voice heard. So I hope that, you know, this conversation at least inspired one or two more people to get out there and whether it's attending the summit, whether it's taking a more active role you know, on a on a more micro level, it's really easy to have these conversations where we vent about our frustrations in the doctor's lounge or in the cafeteria. But, you know, organized medicine in all of its forms is the area where, you know, that lone urologist who's working in rural America gets to stand alongside the urologist who is working at some of the busiest urban centers to really move forward our profession. And I'm just so happy to have had the opportunity to kind of share my passion about this with you and with the Backtable um, listenership. I think it's great that we're kind of discussing these issues because I think historically people thought I can't get involved. It's like you said, whether it's an old boys club or a closed door or whatnot, but that's really not the case. You know, one final thing I wanted to ask you about, Richka, is... So this whole enterprise, right, AUA staff, fellowships with funding, it takes money. And one of the things that I think that myself as like a perfect example, I have not like ponied up and like written a check for like a thousand bucks to like whoever to support whatever. I get the sense that many other professions lobby in a bigger way and they have deeper pockets. And some of this is like money talks, you have a seat at the table, maybe you're not meeting like the 22 year old straight out of college, but the 45 year old person who's, you know, kind of runs it or the X, Y, and Z. But so we can vote, we can write to our Congress people, local state, whatever. What about if you want to donate to help champion these causes? The AUA has a political action committee, the AUA PAC, and we're always looking for contributions on the policy side to the PAC. They are completely nonpartisan. They actually post and it's available. You can see who they've donated to in the past. And they make a very concerted effort to balance their contributions to candidates who are going to be supportive of urology's advocacy priorities and advancing healthcare in general. So the AUA PAC is the forefront political action committee for urology. And I would highly recommend anyone who's so inclined to donate. Trainees have the opportunity to donate as well. And the nice thing about being a trainee is it takes a lot less to get the free gear to be at like the higher <laughs> tier of donor. So there's a little plug for my free Yeti that I got last year. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. There's always swag to kind of, you know, bring you in if, if nothing else. Exactly. Well, Richka, thanks again for your time. Congrats on what you've been able to do. Keep it going. And on behalf of our community and our field, you know, we certainly need people like you that are tackling things from the top down. Thanks again for this opportunity. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you at a summit. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Patwardhan. 
social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.